Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this event in the American Inspiration Author Series, presented by American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, and Porter Square Books, in partnership with Mass Audubon. I'm Margaret Talkett, the series producer. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of history, looking particularly at the bald eagle, both as an icon and as a bird, an important bird to our country. On your screen is the schedule for our hour-long event featuring Jack E. Davis and his new book. After an illustrated presentation about the bald eagle, the improbable journey of America's bird, Mr. Davis will be in conversation with tonight's moderator, the naturalist, Scott Widensall. More on them in a moment. For now, some quick housekeeping items. We are in a Zoom webinar format, which means that your microphone is muted and your video is off. We cannot take your comments in the chat, but do look there for some links relevant to tonight's talk. Many of you shared questions in advance, which are in Scott's hands now in person at Porter Square Books in Boston. Thank you so much for this advanced questions. An additional query or two may be addressed live by our audience, again, in the Porter Square Bookstore in Boston, in the Seaport, where they are now. If you have a late breaking question, put it into the Q&A button on the right of your screen. David Sandberg, bookstore owner and also a co-presenter tonight, he will be serving up those questions, those last questions. David, thank you to you and your team for all you do for authors and all you do for all of us. Thank you and thank you for being there. Tonight's program is being recorded by my colleagues at NEHGS's Brew Family Learning Center. The video will be published on our website in the days ahead. Tonight's tech producer, Courtney Reardon, will Zoom email you when it's posted. It'll be freely accessible on the American Inspiration video archive. Of course, the real education comes, the real deep learning and the appreciation uh, comes from reading and enjoying Jack's book, The Bald Eagle. It is at once a work of history and it's a story of conservation. It takes us from Roman times to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, when the founding fathers struggled to find an appropriate symbol for our new country. It looks at the years when eagles were hated and their brutal slayings across America. And most hopefully, it measures the impact of the all-important Clean Water Act of 1972. Indeed, the eagle is America's improbable bird. It's a bird of paradox, as the Boston Globe called it. Jack's research and this book is truly fascinating. Copies of the book can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books. Order online using the code AMINT22 and you will get a signed copy. Of course, those of you in person tonight at the bookstore will meet Jack and Scott and get your book signed there. We wish we were all with you and we hope you enjoy your time together. Now, some brief words about Jack for introduction. Jack Davis is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Gulf, The Making of an American Sea. He also authored An Everglades Providence, Marjorie Stoneman Jug Douglas, and the American Environmental Century. Mr. Davis is the Rothman Family Chair in the Humanities at the University of Florida. In addition to his home in Florida, he also lives part-time in New Hampshire, which is lucky for all of us down here in Massachusetts. Uh, now for some additional words about our moderator, um, I hand you over to my co-presenter this evening, Wayne Peterson of Matt, Mass Audubon. Wayne, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you, Margaret. It's uh, indeed a pleasure. And I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to participate um, with Porter Square and with your organization. And obviously, uh, we're looking forward to hearing from Jack. But it, tonight, it's uh, my specific responsibility and pleasure to introduce the moderator in the form of Scott Widensall, who's the author of more than two dozen books on natural history, including the Pulitzer Prize finalist, Living on the Wind, and his latest, the New York Times bestseller, A World on the Wing. Scott is a contributing editor for Audubon and writes for a variety of other publications. He's also a fellow of the American Ornithological Society, an active field researcher, 
studying northern sawwit owl migration for more than two decades, bird migration in Alaska, and a winter movements of snowy owl project through Project Snowstorm, something which he actually co-founded. He's, uh, he's also a really interesting person um, in, in many ways and a splendid naturalist, um, a wonderful teacher, obviously a fine author. So I think uh, this evening's exchange between Scott and Jack will be something that uh, everybody will enjoy. And I'm sure that there'll be some very insightful questions and, and uh, insightful answers as well. So this looks and promises to be uh, a splendid evening. So at this point, I think- Thank you. Effectively Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Wayne, and it's, it's great to be here with you. And welcome, Jack, to Boston and to this online seminar, um, if you're there with us. It's wonderful to think of you up the street in the seaport, and um, it's great that all of the audience there gets to see you. And for Wayne's and my audience, um, Wayne's across the state of Massachusetts and mine across the country, we are very glad to all of you that you're here in Zoom land. Um, there is a lot of excitement tonight and we wanna get started. So Jack, if you're there, take it away. Thank you, Margaret. And, and it's a pleasure to be here in Boston uh, and pleasure to talk to um, everybody across the, uh, the region and, and the country, perhaps. And I, I obviously, I love to talk about the bald eagle and I have um, uh, some things I'd like to share with you today. Um, let me, I, I like to begin um, by um, talking about the bald eagle itself or the age of the bald eagle or how long it's been around. The best we know is probably a million years according to fossil evidence. And eagles have been on, on Earth for many more millions of years, but the bald eagle only about a million. But for our conversation tonight, I want to start in 1782 and with the, the first slide of the, the presentation here. And, uh, or, well, actually, it would be the second slide. Thanks. Um, and um, so 1782, of course, it was when the Great Seal of the United States was, was founded. Um, the bald eagle was placed on the front of the seal. It wasn't an obvious choice at first. It took Congress six years to uh, come up with a, um, a design that uh, everyone could, uh, could agree on. Um, and, and it wasn't until 1782 that uh, the bald eagle was considered for the great seal of the United States. Um, now, many people believe that Franklin wanted an alternative bird for the great seal of the United States. Um, that's actually a myth. Uh, which I write about in the book, and I'm not going to share with you tonight. Uh, if you want to know the real story, uh, you'll, you'll have to read the book. And, but he did propose something else for the Great Seal other than the, than the bald eagle. And what he proposed um, will, uh, well, I, I'll, we'll just put, say it surprised you, and that's an understatement. Um, uh, I was very much uh, shocked when I learned what he wanted for the Great Seal of the United States. Uh, but it was Charles Thompson, who was the secretary of the Continental Congress, who decided that the bald eagle should be presented on the front of the, of the seal. And he, his instructions said he wanted the American bald eagle. Those are his uh, exact words. Now, eagles have been used in heraldry on uh, nation uh, state um, uh, seals and, and coats of arms, dating back to the ancients, to the Greeks and the Romans. But all of those eagles um, before the Great Seal of the United States were uh, non-ornithological, just generic eagles of no specific species. The bald eagle is the first identifiable species on a national seal. And it's highly recognizable we, 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 without any problem. It has a white head, white tail, and, and, and dark body. Uh, among the many eagle species, uh, it is the only one uh, that looks uh, like the bald eagle, the bald eagle only. And it was an ideal choice on the part of uh, Charles Thompson for a number of reasons. One is that the bald eagle is an all American bird. It lives in the wild nowhere else outside of North America. Um, the golden eagle is another bird uh, that lives in North America, but it lives across the Northern hemisphere as well. Uh, but the bald eagle, again, is uh, truly an all-American. Uh, another reason is that the United States at the time wanted to assert its own identity 
um, separate of European influences. And so to have this all American bird was a way to convey that identity. And, um, but also, and next slide please, if you look at a bald eagle, you can see it has that suborbital ridge or bone above uh, its eyes, which serve as a sun visor for the species. Um, but for us, it, it, it forms that ideal don't tread on me stare. I don't see how, you, uh, how Thompson could have picked a be better bird than, 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 than the bald eagle. You know, it's very, it's charismatic. Uh, it conveys strength and courage and freedom. All of those uh, traits that the, uh, uh, the, the young republic uh, wanted to associate itself with and assert. Uh, uh, across the world. Uh, and before the bald eagle went on the Great Seal of the United States, again in 1782, the U.S. was one year away from going to uh, uh, Paris to sign uh, the, uh, uh, the treaty to end uh, the war with, with Great Britain. Uh, before the bald eagle became um, a symbol of the United States, it didn't really appear in the decorative arts in the colonies and the states. Uh, it didn't appear on business logos Generic eagles did, but, but not necessarily the bald eagle. But once it went on the Great Seal of the United States, it became an, in, the image of the bald eagle became an instant hit. Uh, Americans loved it and they started putting it on everything. Uh, of course, federal insignia uh, and, and state government insignia, uh, but also in, in popular culture, on business logos, on organizational um, logos. Uh, on sports team uniforms. Next slide, please. Here you can see in the, in the bottom right is a, a band from uh, a marching band of the late 19th century. And of course the famous New York Eagles on the upper left uh, of, the, of the Negro Leagues. Uh, the Eagle um, uh, insignia, the image, uh, the name became hugely popular, just grew even more popular through the 19th century and on into the 20th century. Um, we see it everywhere to, where today. Uh, yeah, at the same time, while Americans embraced the, the, the image of the bald eagle, uh, they didn't care very much at all for the species. Next, next uh, slide, please. Uh, the bald eagle is an apex predator and Americans treated it uh, even after it became a national symbol. Americans treated the bald eagle uh, as a, uh, like any other predator, such as a wolf or a coyote or a mountain lion or, or a bear. An eagle scene was an eagle to be shot. Uh, and this was the attitude throughout the 19th century and on into the early 20th century. Uh, and uh, the bald eagle was accused of all sorts of crimes, uh, crimes that it wasn't guilty of. Um, it was accused of of carrying away uh, a lot, all sorts of livestock, calves, pigs, uh, sheep, uh, and chickens. And of those, a bald eagle can carry and can take away, fly away with a chicken, but it can't lift a calf off the ground. It can't lift uh, a sheep off the ground. But even ornithologists were saying that bald eagles were stealing um, uh, livestock that weighed as much, even more than the bald eagle. Uh, John James Audubon maintained that he was aware of a bald eagle that, uh, that carried away more than its weight, um, but a bald eagle simply can't do that. Uh, and so uh, American livestock was to be protected, and uh, most everybody in the 19th century had chickens in their yards. They raised uh, broilers and, and, uh, and laying chickens for, for the eggs. Uh, and, uh, and so the, shooting a bald eagle was, was considered a public service, if not for yourself, for, for your neighbor. Uh, and, but also another myth at the time uh, was that um, mothers were warned not to leave their children alone outside or infants alone outside, unless they want a bald eagle uh, to fly away with it to their nest. Next slide, please. Uh, and, in the 19th century, in the McGuffey's, Re McGuffey's Reader, which was next to the Bible, was the most uh, read book in America uh, throughout the 19th century. McGuffey's Reader uh, contained a story of a bald eagle that, uh, that uh, lifted a, a child off the ground and took it back to its eagle nest, and the, the town rose up to try to save the eagle. And the, the uh, illustration that accompanied the story 
uh, uh, was of a girl um, in the talons of an eagle. Uh, and the girl who was uh, at least six or seven years old, simply impossible. Uh, and uh, and with the image you see here is from a, an Edison studio film of 1908, a silent film. Uh, and in this story, uh, the, the title of the film, by the way, is Rescued from an Eagle's Nest. Uh, and in this film, uh, a, a a lumberjack who lives in the woods with his wife and his child in his cabin uh, in the opening scene walks outside, kisses his wife and daughter goodbye, skips off into the woods with his ax on his shoulder to go to work. Uh, and the wife, the mother leaves her child outside to play while she goes inside, uh, inside the cabin. Uh, and in the next scene, you see this black eagle, the one you're seeing in the picture on you can see the wires attached to its wings uh, and uh, flying across the, in, in the, in the backdrop behind the cabin across the screen. And these are in the days of silent films. And you can watch this uh, movie on YouTube today, as a matter of fact, it has no sound accompanying it, uh, no music, but you, you can, when you watch the scene, you can, you can hear the orchestra in the, um, excuse me, you can hear the organ in the orchestra, orchestra pick rise uh, in uh, crescendo uh, sounds um, with this eagle flying across the back. And the next scene, the eagle swoops down and grabs his child, which has its own wires. Uh, and the child is being carried off and it's crying. It's not acting, it's actually crying. This, this of course, in the days and uh, before child actors had any sort of protection. And uh, the mother runs out and sees this happening and she rushes off into the woods, finds her husband, uh, who runs to the edge of a cliff and looks down, and there on the ledge in the eagle's nest is his, is his child, and he climbs down the side of the mountain, uh, ends up in a scuffle with, a, uh, with this eagle. Uh, a club magically appears in his hand, another bit of special effects from 1908, uh, and uh, he clubs the, uh, the eagle unconscious and kicks it over the ledge and saves his child. And uh, one thing that uh, I found really fascinating about this film is, is that the man who played um, the father was none other than D.W. Griffith. And that, of course, is the man who, who made the movie, directed and made the movie, The Birth of a Nation in 1915, which led to the resurrection of the Ku Klux Klan. And interestingly enough, when Rescued from an Eagle's Nest was reviewed by the critics, they panned D.W. Griffith's acting, and uh, he decided to go into directing. And of course, that led to his, his famous movie. Uh, so on into the early, uh, early 20th century, uh, these myths existed, and eagles were still being shot, uh, to the point that by the late 19th century, they had all but disappeared from the eastern seaboard states. So let me put that in perspective. When the Europeans settled North America, the estimated bald eagle population was approximately 500,000. When Congress, the Continental Congress in Philadelphia adopted the Great Seal in 1782, there were probably eagle nests every mile to two miles along the Delaware River. But by the late 19th century, they're all gone. Uh, in Midwestern states, there were very few eagles. There are so few eagles east of the Mississippi that Americans believe that bald eagles were Rocky Mountain birds. And many were worried that the bald eagle population in the lower 48 might go, by, um, go the way of the, uh, of, the, of the passenger pigeon, the last of which died in 1914 in the Cincinnati Zoo, and the Par Carolina parakeet, the last of which died also in the Cincinnati Zoo in, in, in 1918. Uh, and so there were many people who began to organize and call for the protection of the living bird behind the national symbol. Uh, yet in 1917, uh, when uh, the year that America entered World War I, uh, the territory of Alaska uh, adopted a, a bald eagle bounty to protect, allegedly to protect the salmon industry, uh, to protect salmon fishermen from this unnecessary, unnecessary competitor, the bald eagle. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the bald eagle bounty um, remained in effect in Alaska until 1952, from 1917 to 1952. So anybody could go out and shoot a bald eagle in Alaska, turn it in the talons, and, 
and collect up to 50 cents, uh, uh, collect anywhere from 50 cents to $2 for a set of talons. And during that period, the territory of Alaska paid bounties on, on over 128,000 bald eagles. And I conducted a search in newspapers.com when I was doing my research um, with the dates from 1850 to 1920 with the three words, bald eagle shot. Uh, and I got over 140,000 hits. So we all, we hear about the slaughter of the bison, but we don't hear about the slaughter of the bald eagle. Uh, and so um, uh, many people push National Audubon uh, to, um, uh, to, to lobby Congress for bald eagle protection, to lobby against the, the Alaska bounty. But National Audubon, under the leadership at the time, refused to do so. Uh, and uh, this horrified many people, including this woman in the next slide, please, Rosalie Edge, who was an Audubon member. And in response to um, National Audubon's refusal to protect uh, the bald eagle or any other raptor uh, for, for that matter, organized an or, uh, a group she uh, uh, called the Emergency Conservation Committee, um, which exposed the duplicity of National Audubon. Here was this birding organization, uh, the most influential conservation group at the time, the best funded um, that was supposed to be protecting birds but would not protect the living species behind um, the national symbol. Um, and Rosalie Edge and others were responsible for uh, convincing Congress in 1940 to pass the Bald Eagle Protection Act. And you can read in the legislation, um, of course, 1940, the United States is a year away from going to war to, uh, against fascist tyranny. And you can read in the legislation uh, that Congress acknowledged that to lose the living species um, behind this powerful symbol of freedom uh, would have undermined the integrity of that, uh, that symbol, the symbol that represented uh, uh, democracy and, and freedom, uh, the bird of freedom that was denied its own freedom. But the 1940 Bald Eagle Protection Act was in many ways a form of redemption on the part of Americans. It was the first federal protection uh, to um, uh, give, uh, to safeguard uh, an individual species. All wildlife protection before the 1940 Bald Eagle Protection Act uh, covered multiple species. But, uh, but the bald eagle got its own act, uh, its own federal protection, its own federal law. Unfortunately, five years later, next, next slide please, DDT was released on the general market. And we're probably all familiar with uh, its impact on wildlife across the country. Uh, the lower 48 was blanketed uh, in DDT. It was used in agriculture and forestry. It was used in, it was used in, uh, in, in people's homes. It was, it was, it was everywhere. Uh, and the impact on bird population was significant. Ospreys and, and brown pelicans disappeared, for instance, from parts of the Gulf of Mexico. So did bald eagles. Um, and by 1963, the bald eagle nesting population of 48 had fallen to um, uh, probably an all-time low. It was one of the first uh, systematic census uh, taking of uh, a nesting population in the lower 48. There were only 487 uh, nesting bald eagles in the lower 48. Uh, remember, there were 500,000, at least 500,000 bald eagles continent-wide um, at the time of the revolution. Uh, Alaska had, uh, Congress had forced Alaska in 1952 uh, to abandon its uh, bald eagle bounty. The, the Alaskan bald eagle population was, was fairly healthy in 1962 because it had not been uh, so saturated with DDT. But in the eastern seaboard states, um, a bald eagle sighting was very rare. In New England, for example, Maine was the only New England state with nesting bald eagles as late as 1970. Uh, across the South, uh, only Florida uh, had a steady bald eagle nesting population. Midwestern states had no nesting and many Midwestern states, lower Midwestern states had no bald eagle nesting populations. So the, 
uh, so the bald eagle population was at the verge of extinction, at the brink of extinction in, in the lower 48 states. But in 1972, things began to change. That was a watershed year for the bald eagle. A number of things happened. One, Congress uh, increased the penalty for harming a bald eagle. It also added raptors, including the bald eagle, to um, the migratory bald, uh, excuse me, the Migratory Bird uh, Treaty Act. Uh, and the EPA, under uh, the first administrator, Williams, uh, William Ruckel's house, uh, banned uh, the sale of DT, DDT in the United States with the support of uh, President Nixon, a highly controversial uh, um, uh, act on the part of the EPA and the administration uh, generally. Uh, also in 1972, um, uh, Congress with decisive bipartisan support, 50 years ago this October, um, passed the, uh, the Clean Water Act. Uh, by this time, uh, more than three quarters of America's freshwater bodies and coastal uh, waters were unsafe for swimming and fishing. That also meant that the aquatic life had diminished significantly. The bald eagle is a fishing raptor. It depends primarily upon fish. It'll, it, it'll eat birds and land animals, but it prefers fish. Uh, its watery habitat had been destroyed by all sorts of pollution, DDT, uh, wastewater pollution, industrial pollution. The Clean Water Act started turning things around significantly uh, for both humans, um, but also for uh, fishing birds. Uh, and uh, you could have all of the protective legislation in the world. You could have the Bald Eagle Protection Act. You could have the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Uh, you, you could uh, ban DDT. But if you didn't clean up America's water, uh, you wouldn't bring back the aquatic plant life that brought back the fish that brought back the birds. Um, and recognizing all of these um, advances for the bald eagle, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, in the year of the bicentennial 1976 launched bald eagle restoration programs across the country. And we can talk more in detail about them in, in, in the Q&A. But let me just say for now that these restoration uh, programs were hugely successful, um, particularly in uh, New England. A uh, restoration program was launched at Quabbin Reservoir in, in Massachusetts, um, which, which brought uh, ultimately and um, brought uh, um, bald eagle, nesting bald eagles back to the other New England states. Uh, same thing in the South, the bald eagle population was, was restored um, and uh, largely because of these restoration programs and the Clean Water Act and protection. But also, next slide please, also because of volunteers such as this wo woman, uh, there, there are thousands of women like this, uh, like Doris uh, Mager here, who, um, was, is, who I talk about in, in great detail in, in, in my book. In 1979, she climbed a, uh, a 50 foot loblolly pine in Florida and lived in an abandoned bald eagle's nest for six days to uh, bring awareness to the plight of the bald eagles, but also to raise money for uh, an Eagle Rehabil Rehabilitation Center at Florida Audubon. Uh, and what she did gained national attention. She was on Life and Look magazine. She was in uh, newspapers across the country. She was even on Paul Harvey's radio show. She, uh, she was the rest of the story. Um, and, um, and, and she raised enough money to start a rehab uh, center in, in Florida. And uh, in the 1970s and the 1980s, you see uh, raptor rehabilitation centers um, um, uh, being um, uh, um, opening up in states all across the country, largely because of volunteers uh, and, and donations. Virtually every state in the country has at least uh, one raptor re rehabilitation center. Some of them have multiple. Uh, and, uh, but, all of the, but also we have to credit, next slide please, uh, the bald eagles themselves for their, their comeback. Um, bald eagles have what you might call the perfect family values. Uh, they mate for life. They maintain a fidelity to the same nest as long as that nest exists. They can live in the wild uh, into their 30s. They can live in captivity into the 40s. And if that nest 
um, and nesting tree exists for 30 years, so they'll return, and and, and the territory is still a territory that a territory that's suitable to them, um, provides them with uh, their uh, the food sources. They'll return to that nest. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, they live, they generally build their nests within 100 to 200 yards of water, um, healthy water where they, they can catch fish. They also uh, feed their uh, care for the young um, with such devotion, uh, feed them so well uh, that, and they're typically uh, two eggs per nest, uh, sometimes one, sometimes three. So they're typically raising a brood of two. Um, they feed them so well that, the, that by the time that the, the young leave the, the nesting territory, they often weigh more than their parents. Next slide, please. Here's a, here's a picture of a, of a juvenile. This is probably a year or two year old juvenile. When they leave the nest, uh, they, they, they are chocolate brown um, virtually all over and they'll, they'll start forming white um, um, uh, modeled white feathers uh, during their early years. They reach mating age um, at four to five years old, and that's when they'll have their white head and white tail, uh, their, their yellow feet and toes, and, and their yellow beaks. Uh, next slide, please. So restoration, this is an image of, of the um, uh, migration pattern or lack of pattern, if you will, of, of bald eagles. Uh, you can see, uh, for instance, bald eagles, let me look at, let's look at Florida, bald eagles uh, leaving their breeding tory at the end of the breeding season uh, migrate, some migrate just next door to Georgia, some migrate all the way up to uh, Canada. The northern ba bald eagles will migrate southward, the northern ba uh, southern bald eagles will migrate northward. Look over at Saskatchewan, um, bald eagles from S Saskatchewan after breeding season will migrate to, some of them will migrate to Colorado, but then some Colorado birds will migrate to Saskatchewan. So they're passing each other in, in, in the sky. Um, and uh, it's typically the juveniles that, that fly the longer distance. Uh, the, 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 um, the, uh, the adults, uh, some of them will stay within their breeding territory. They will not stay in their nest. They, they will branch um, and, and many of them will not fly very, uh, very far away. Um, and they return to their nest year after year, but so do the juveniles. They'll come back to their natal territory. That's the territory that they've imprinted on, and that's the territory where they will typically find a mate or bring back a mate and build a nest uh, and, and raise generations of, of, of young eagles, um, which is really the reason behind, one of the, another reason behind the success of the restoration program. Um, next slide, please. So the comeback of the bald eagle was so successful that uh, the population in the lower 48 was healthy enough to, uh, for the bald eagle to come off the endangered species list, uh, which was enacted in 1973. Uh, in 1999, however, bureaucratic delays, uh, bureaucratic inertia, I should say, in Washington delayed delisting until 2007 when the population, the nesting population in, in the lower 48 was between 10 and 11,000. Now in the 2010s, uh, the population of bald eagles, the larger population, uh, more than just a nesting population quadrupled to the point that today, next slide please. Today, the bald eagle population in the lower 48 is over, over 300,000. Uh, in Alaska, probably between somewhere over um, 70, probably 70, 75,000. In Canada, um, uh, and probably another 70,000. So the bald eagle population today is um, uh, somewhere around 500,000 uh, continent-wide, returning to that estimated number at the time of European contact. Uh, next slide, please. So today the bald eagle is thriving, which is not to say there aren't dangers um, uh, that exist, which Scott and I can talk about in the Q&A. So I'm going to stop there um, and run downstairs and, and join you with Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. That was uh, 
That was spectacular, a, a very complete overview and certainly uh, appreciated by all of our audiences, virtual and live. And in a sense, this, this brings me to Mass Audubon and the reason that Mass Audubon was invited to participate in, it, in this effort as part. We are a very large conservation organization. We've been around since 1896 and have been uh, singularly successful in raising the bar in terms of not just bird conservation, but also conservation on a broad front. So that these days we're as concerned with issues like climate change and, and pollution and, and energy and so on as a great many other um, groups increasingly are. And because we're a membership organization, we have 140,000 members at current and, and these people are essentially behind this effort, the kind of efforts that uh, Jack was talking about. So through education and, and uh, outdoor opportunities, as well as uh, research internally, uh, Mass Audubon has been on the forefront of a lot of things for um, since the, the late 1800s. And I think that's a tribute. If we think about Jack's uh, comments in terms of um, eagle restoration and some of the efforts that were put in place um, as far as getting eagles back on the landscape, Mass Audubon has also had a hand in that effort. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. This is kind of a short bulleted list of, of the way in which the organization that I work for was involved. Um, in 1982, in, in conjunction with the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife um, and supporting uh, money from various other organizations, we started a restoration program in 1982 that basically brought uh, young eagles from Michigan to the Quabbin Reservoir, which is uh, the largest unnatural body of water in Massachusetts in the central part of the state. Um, and young eagles were placed in a tower, a, a cage as it were, um, and they were fed in a blind situation. So they weren't aware that they were being fed by humans. So they wouldn't get imprinted on people. And then ultimately, once they reach fledging age, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see in the bottom picture here, uh, the dark ones at the top are the, the original juveniles. And as Jack was pointing out, they're very dark in color. And at the bottom, once the door was opened, it was only a matter of a very short time, but what the eagles, once they were of that age, were ready to fledge and they, they set forth. And the hope was that, you know, by the time they were four to five years old and would return to the Quab in the same way that uh, Jack was suggesting eagles do, um, that they would nest. And indeed they did. And the rest is essentially history because from that seminal population that was started at Quabbin, we, um, we now have over 70 pairs of nesting bald eagles in Massachusetts. And uh, the first nesting on Cape Cod was as recently as only two years ago. But the last positive nesting in Massachusetts prior to all of this effort beginning in the early 80s was in uh, 1915 down on Cape Cod where a pair nested uh, in Sandwich. So this has been a real success story. And, and if you have followed, you know, some of the work with peregrine falcons and ospreys and pelicans and so on, there've been a lot of success stories. So in spite of some of the, the dark history associated with some of these big apex predators, there have been efforts to, to get them turned around. And a lot of them are, are in fact making uh, pretty good progress. So at, that, at this point, I think, um, we can be proud to say that bald eagles are once again soaring and nesting in Massachusetts and, and they're doing pretty well. They have other problems, not surprisingly, but um, that's a subject for probably the Q&A that's going to follow. So I'm gonna turn this back over to uh, um, Scott and, and uh, Jack so that we can hear some of the questions that our online and, and live audience have and bring to bear.
Yes. Yeah, seems yes. strange, strangely exciting and strangely freaky. Oh. In addition to having to brave the weather. Um, yeah, that's for sure. Um, it was great. Thank all of you for coming out. So I just, maybe the best way to start, Jack, is the, the book is amazing, but why Bald Eagles? Uh, so a, a number of reasons. Uh, I wanted to write, you know, you're an environmental writer, I'm an environmental writer, and uh, often in environmental writing focuses on the grim and the tragic. Uh, and I, I wanted to give readers a break uh, from that. There's plenty of grim and tragic um, uh, in the history of the, uh, in the Bald Eagles history with the, with the American people. Uh, but there is also redemption and there, there is this great success and it's, in uh, its population come back. And, uh, and so I wanted to, to write a, about a success story, one that as we're facing environmental challenges of the 21st century, uh, a story that could give us um, some positive reinforcements and, and show us that uh, not all is grim and not all is negative, not all is grim and, and grim and tragic, but also, you know, you and I are uh, the, the same age and, when you and I are growing up, um, we did, really didn't see bald eagles. Yes. And, and uh, we, you know, even 10, 15 years ago, a bald eagle um, was, was a, uh, in the sky was a rare sighting. And, but we're seeing them uh, increasingly today. We see them all the time. And, and, uh, and I call it a poke, in the, uh, poke the guy in the ribs uh, a moment of excitement when we see a bald eagle crossing the sky. And people are really excited. The nest cams are, are the most popular wildlife cams mm -hmm. in, in, in the world. And uh, so I wanted to write, I wanted people to know a little something about this bird in our history, uh, since we're seeing it so, so, more, so frequently now. Well, I'm curious, what, I mean, what was, what was your connection with bald eagles growing up? I mean, you've, you've got a professional connection with the Everglades and with, with the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. But I mean, what did bald eagles mean to you at a younger age when they were still very rare? I, they didn't, uh, they were the national, uh, national symbol, you know, to me, I, I didn't see them in a while. I grew up on Tampa Bay in Florida, but this was an estuarine environment that was on um, a verge of ecological, ecological collapse. Mm -hmm. And so when I was a kid fishing uh, on Tampa Bay in the 1970s, I, 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 if I got lucky, I could catch croaker, which is not a very exciting fish to catch. Uh, and I didn't see much bird life other than um, uh, brown pelicans and, and, and gulls. And, uh, but we brought that bait back to life. Uh, we, it had lost 85% of its seagrass beds and it's had 100% regrowth now. And with that seagrass came back to fish and our, our fishing fun, but also uh, the birds came back. So now you see all sorts of bird life there. I never saw an osprey growing up. Uh, and we say uh, we see lots of osprey and we started seeing bald eagles again. So just the excitement of seeing it um, uh, return is uh, is really my only connection. Yeah. So it's really it's a, it's a flagship bird, not just for the nation, but also for for environmental restoration in a lot of ways. Yes, it, it, it is a flagship bird for environmental restoration. And in fact, when um, it was proposed for delisting um, conservation groups across the country, uh, wanted the bald eagle to come off the, 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 the endangered species list because they wanted to use it as a poster bird, as an example of how effective the Endangered Species Act is. Right. Because again, we don't get those success stories right. as often as we yeah, should. Yeah, that's exactly right. We're talking about flagships, and this is a, a little bit of a twist on that. You know, your book traces the, the roller coaster that, that bald eagles have gone through. I mean, they've been symbols symbols of the nation, they've been reviled pests, they've been, um, you know, they're, they're an, an icon of native spirituality. They have gone to war, metaphorically speaking, yeah. but there was one bald eagle that went to war literally. Litter. Talk yeah. a little bit about Old Abe. This is one of the most fascinating yeah. stories in the book. Yeah, as you said, that's, that was Old Abe. Old Abe was born in Wisconsin in 18, or he hatched in Wisconsin in 1861. He was taken from his nest uh, or from his nesting tree um, by, by a Native American and, and sold a couple of times and eventually made his way to become the mascot of a, of a Wisconsin regiment. And, uh, and old A uh, was, uh, was literally enlisted into the US military and he, or at least the Wisconsin militia. 
Uh, and he went to um, war and served in, or uh, was part of uh, at least two dozen battles, if not three dozen, including Vicksburg, one of the most violent battles of, and decisive battles of, of the war. And, uh, and he would be held up on a staff uh, next to the, the American flag and marched onto the battlefield. And the Confederates hated him. Uh, and they target him and they wing them once, um, but uh, 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 fortunately didn't harm him. Uh, and then he was um, mustered out of the military at the end of the war. And he ended up um, be, um, living in the basement of the um, Capitol building of uh, the, the state of Wisconsin. And uh, he served duty after the war, raising um, you know, again, as a symbol and to raise uh, money for war veterans and, and orphans. Um, and uh, he lived for, for 20 years. Unfortunately, the, the Capitol building um, burned in uh, 1881, I think it was, uh, just before he was 20 years old and he died of smoke inhalation. But then they mounted him. Uh, and, and took him out of the basement. He had his own cage. He had a two apartment cage in the basement of the Capitol building. Um, they, they mounted him and they put him up on the main floor. But then the Capitol burning, as, as buildings did in those days, burned again. We lost them all together. And as I say, this, is a, this was an eagle that existed between the symbol universe of the eagles and the species universe of the eagle. Um, and, is, and I say that his 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 death and then the, the loss of his his uh, taxidermic body um, was symbolic of how he was not supposed to be a living symbol. Yeah. So we had a lot of questions from folks online um, prior to this, um, asking about the conservation story, mm -hmm. much of what you've already you've already covered. But a lot of people were asking a question which I had as well, which is we've we've brought bald eagles back, as you said, to almost to the point where, where they were in pre-contact days. But, you know, the world is still a threatening place. The world is still a dangerous place. What keeps you awake at night worrying about bald eagles, if anything? I mean, is it climate change, habitat loss, other contaminants? What, what worries you? I, I think is, yeah, I'm not so worried about climate change for bald eagles, certainly other, other species, but the bald eagle can uh, live in, in cold uh, areas, it can leave, they can live all over North America. And so it can, it can move about as long as it can find food, it'll be fine. Um, but what I do worry about is as its ex population continues to expand, as our population continues to expand, expand, there will be continual confrontations between the two. Um, and automobile strikes are becoming more common, air strikes, um, the, the, um, uh, electric power industry is, has risen to the, the occasion and is doing a good job of, of adapting technology for the wind generator sites, which has reduced um, bird death generally, including bald eagle and golden eagle significantly. They've had great success with that. But right now, the greatest danger to bald eagles and um, California condors is lead from hunting, uh, from shot in, in bullets. And hunters are, you know, as, as you know, they're among our original and best conservationists. And a deer and elk hunter tends to uh, gut his or her uh, kill in the woods, which seems like a good idea. Well, you know, uh, the guts uh, left behind will, will feed the scavengers and the bald eagle is a famous scavenger. Um, and, but unfortunately, uh, those gut piles contain lead from the shot and a shard of lead the size of a grain of salt. A, a grain of, uh, of rice can, can kill a bald eagle. Uh, so that's its greatest, its greatest threat right now. But also I have to say, Scott, I fear that as it po its population continues to expand and, and there are increasing confrontations between um, humans and, and bald eagles that um, fish and wildlife will step in and say, we need to start managing bald eagles, the bald eagle population. And you know what managing means? That means culling. Um, just as we manage black bears in, in many states. Um, we have um, many states host hunting seasons of black bears. And that's what I, so I worry about that as well. And there have, as, as you and I discussed previously, there's been ripple effects as bald eagle populations have come back. They've had, a, they've had impacts on other birds, including some endangered birds. Um, yes. Right here on, on the coast of New England, we have to have biologists stationed out on seabird nesting islands 
like Eastern Egg Rock in, in, uh, in Maine, in order in part to keep bald eagles from coming in and wiping out these, these very restricted seabird colonies. As the eagle population's grown, those seabird populations have, have remained fairly yeah. small. So it's a, yeah. you're right, it's a balancing. Yeah, balancing. it is, it is balancing. I'm, I'm curious, what, as, you, as you dove into this subject, what surprised you the most about, about bald eagles and their history? Well, about bald eagles, I, I um, would be those those ideal family values, as as I as I talked about, uh, and uh, that was really impressive. How to me, how dedicated they are to their their broods, and um, as and I I knew about a little bit about the direct attack on bald eagles throughout the nineteenth and early twentieth century, but I wasn't aware. Of, um, how complete the slaughter was, and uh, that um, that that was surprising. Um, there are many people in the the book, um, Doris Mager, um, and uh, uh, who, who I mentioned also Rosalie Ed, Rosalie Edge, and and numerous others who um, uh, I, I really came to admire and, and are heroes for for what they did. Uh, there are a few who you would expect to be supporters of the bald eagle who were not, such as T. Gilbert Pearson, mm. the head of Audubon in the early 20th century. Uh, he had other problems other than that too. Uh, and, um, and, and then um, John James Audubon's position on the bald eagle uh, surprised me well as, as well. And what, as I said earlier, what Ben Franklin really wanted for the great <laughs> seal of the United States, uh, it, to put it bluntly, blew my mind. <laughs> and you're not going to give anybody no i'm not gonna that. i'm not gonna give that away and i'm not gonna say i'm gonna say any more about john james audubon but he, he's an interesting guy too yeah there's a lot of layers to the onion that was john james audubon yes that's, that's exactly sure. right um the uh you mentioned rosalie edge and i have to i have to put a plug in for her i i grew up in eastern pennsylvania not yes. far from hawk mountain which you, you showed rosalie was one of those formidable women to whom we the conservation movement owes a great deal and one of her one of her sayings, one of one of her beliefs that I think a lot of us could take in conservation movement could take um, to heart was that the time to save a species is while it's still common. And with a bald, with a bald eagle coming back to what we were talking about before about potential threats, we we shouldn't be complacent about about what we've been able to do for the bald eagle and other species like peregrine falcons and brown pelicans and many others that have recovered. You know, we we need to keep our eye on the ball there. Um, I'm curious, David, you're getting some, some live questions coming in from online. Yes. Um, can you hear me okay on the microphone? I hope so. Uh, here's one. Is it possible that the stellar sea eagle hanging around Maine since December with a bald eagle could mate with the bald eagle? Are they close enough taxonomically? Or maybe more generally, can do, are, are, are eagles species in general so distinct that they can't crossbreed? I, I'm not aware of them crossbreeding, are you? Well, I mean, given the fact that stellar sea eagles are in Kamchatka and Hokkaido and bald eagles are yeah. over here, but I suspect that they're close enough. And mm. Maine has a fairly loose reputation for bird hybridization. There's a, there's a swarm <laughs> of, I, I don't want to get too, too indelicate here. There is, a, there, is a, there, is a, there is a hybrid swarm of, of egrets and herons in southern Maine. Little egret, snowy egret, little blue heron. Little egrets are over from the old world. They've all been sort of hybridizing down there. Um, you've, you've, there's, there's a, there's a, Maine has a reputation. And so <laughs> we'll see what happens. Who would have known Maine of all places? Hey, here's another one. Uh, which state has the most eagles? I assume he's talking about the lower 48 because yeah. you said Alaska. That, 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 would be, that would be Minnesota, which has approximately 10,000 nesting bald eagles. They have a lot of lakes, too. Yeah. Uh, and in northern uh, Minnesota, the bald eagle population uh, throughout the DDT years remained fairly healthy. In fact, many of the uh, birds that were used in the hacking programs, many of the eaglets that were relocated uh, to those empty states, if you will, uh, came from places like Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, northern Michigan, Canada, and, and Alaska. Let me do one more um, that I got, and, I, and then Scott will go back to you. Um, you talked a little bit about climate change and said it shouldn't affect the eagles too much, but someone asked, with rising temperatures, how seriously are they affected? Do they have to move new nests and find new feeding grounds? 
as temperatures rise? Yeah, my, my guess is that that will affect northern bald eagles uh, more so than southern bald eagles. Uh, the southern bald eagles are smaller than the northern. Some scientists refer to them as subspecies. Uh, some say no, it's just separate gene pools. But we do know that um, it be, because of the restoration programs, science learned that the northern bald, the eaglets from the northern bald eagle nest could not survive in the south. Um, because it was too hot, but also at the time there was an avian malaria they, uh, they were not immune to that the southern bald eagles are. So, I, um, I, you know, the southern bald eagles can easily move north if they want cooler weather, and the northern bald eagles, I, I don't see whether they can't continue moving up into northern Canada. Well, and they're, they're exp expanding into parts of uh, central Alaska, yeah. where 30 years ago we never saw yeah. bald eagles. So does that yeah. mean in this part of New England we're getting, we might stop having them as they move further north? I don't, I don't think so. If anything, you might end up with southern bald eagles. You might have a, you know, uh, a Confederate invasion <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the re revenge of Robert E. Lee. Well, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. I'm, I'm trying to watch time and be careful about um, tossing things back to, uh, to Mark. One, One last question. Can I, I want to ask a question. Can I, ask, I want to ask Scott. I said, you know, Scott, I very much ad, ad, admire your work um, um, as a researcher and, and as a writer. Your writing is very engaging. Your books are phenomenal. They're, they're uh, detailed, but yet uh, accessible. And I wonder if you know, I'm a historian, you're a naturalist, and I'm curious about your approach to writing, how to organizing your material, getting the word down on the page. It, I, am, I am not an analytical writer. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very intuitive. Um, I, I tend to find the thread that interests me and follow that, um, which occasionally means some false starts. I've also been accused of writing books that will take me to places that I wanted to go anyway, and that's probably absolutely <laughs> correct. <laughs> Um, I'm starting work on a new book about um, what works for bird conservation around the world, and it gives me a chance to go to yeah. go to some places in uh, in Africa, Asia, South America, and the Arctic that I might not otherwise get to go. Yeah. So, so there's a little bit of self service at, yeah. at work there. Yeah. Well, that makes me feel good because, I, as I said, I admire you as a writer, and I'm the same way. I like to find that thread. Uh, mm -hmm. that stimulates me and it gets me out of bed in the morning right. along with my dark chocolate uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, and so and I and sometimes I don't know where it's going to take me right. and I, I that's, that's what I find most exciting that's, that's exactly the best right part. that's, that's the best it part. really is those surprises yeah. that come along yeah absolutely yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah great okay well I think on that note Margaret I'm going to let you talk to the virtual world uh, we here in the bookstore are going to um, stick around and uh for those of you who are not lucky enough to be here with us, uh, maybe next time, uh, if you're not, if you're in the Boston area, but for now, we're going to say goodbye. I'm going to turn off the Zoom and uh, we'll hang around here in the room. We have learned so much, gentlemen. Thank you for this great discussion. I guess that wraps it up. Um, David and both of our featured authors, thank you so much. Uh, we've learned a lot about nature and conservancy and our country. For greater enlightenment and insight, a reminder to our audiences, copies of both The Bald Eagle and A World on the Wing can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge and in Boston. Um, they go to both places. So great to be there with them tonight. Again, use the code AMINTS22 as you order online, and you'll receive a signed book plated copy of the book. Um, the code does not get you a discount. Um, it just gets you a signed copy. Uh, thank you to our bookstore partners and also thank you to our partners at Mass Audubon. Uh, Wayne, do tell us a little bit about what's coming up for you all at Mass Audubon. Uh, thank you, Margaret. And, and uh, thank you, Jack and Scott both. That was really a very interesting conversation and, and uh, lots of good stuff there. But as far as Mass Audubon is concerned, we have a number of, of nature programs of all sorts. If you go to our website, massaudubon.org backslash programs, um, and just explore the website, you'll find all kinds of offerings of one sort or another, some of them virtual, many of them live these days as we begin to gradually begin to open up things again. So that's one possibility. And then uh, coming up um, until September 5, there's a spectacular uh, exhibit taking place at the Concord Museum um, about William Brewster, who was Mass Audubon's first president and also um, a, a very significant early ornithologist in terms of the establishment of the American Ornithologist Union, 
the oldest bird club in America, the Not All Ornithological Club, and, and uh, did several really lovely books, not all just on ornithology, but rather excerpts from his journals and so forth. So I would suggest that that exhibit is one that some of you that live locally might want to visit. And then finally, um, what's our largest fundraiser of the year at Mass Audubon? Our Birdathon is coming up um, on May 13th and 14th, and there's all kinds of information on how to participate or sponsor birders that you may know and want to um, provide support for that way. Uh, again, at our website, massaudubon.org uh, backslash birdathon. So I would encourage you to use those resources as a way to kind of see what's, what's happening uh, on the home front. But again, I wanna thank uh, Margaret and, and everybody involved here in letting us participate in this event. It certainly was worthwhile and I'm looking forward to reading uh, Jack's book for sure. Wayne, thank you so much. Um, it's been a real pleasure, our first time partnership with Mass Audubon, um, truly to you and Hillary, thank you. And also to Rick. We at American Ancestors NEHGS are delighted to have co-presented tonight's talk. If you're studying American history, heraldry, or iconography, as Jack was, you may find our research center useful. The stacks on Newbury Street are open by appointment, but NEHGS members can visit our digital archives anytime to gain access to 1.4 billion searchable family records. Uh, so you wanna learn more about the Brewsters, uh, come on back to our archives. Free to the public, you can chat with one of our genealogists. Uh, you'll see on screen some educational programs coming up from the Brew Family Learning Center, including a panel I'm hosting on Monday about researching black sheep in your family, whether they are 1960s gambling sharks or Salem witches. Um, our team and Russell Shorto and Debbie Applegate, both uh, prize winning authors, um, have some insights about how to do research. We've got sessions coming up about the revelations in the 1950 census, which is being released on April 1st, which is a very big deal uh, among genealogists. It should be a big deal for you too. Um, and uh, so if you want to learn about how to research and plumb the 1950 census for details, uh, join us for that. It's a free event. We're also hosting a multi-day, multi-night course on building genealogical skills for those of you who might be new to that. And for you literary sorts, which I am, uh, join us for more free virtual author talks in the American Inspiration Author Series. On April 4, we'll welcome Maud Newton with her book, Ancestor Trouble, A Reckoning and a Reconciliation. She's going to be in conversation with Casey Sepp, the New Yorker staff writer. She's also the author of that new best-selling biography of Harper Lee. Uh, so don't miss these two women and their riveting book talk looking at the American South, identities and families. Some of these families are not to be believed. So uh, check that out. And then on April 11, we're welcoming Professor Carol Emberton. She's going to talk us through her book, To Walk About in Freedom, The Long Emancipation of Priscilla Joyner. This book looks at one woman's quest to define freedom after the Civil War. And by virtue of that, she really looks at what it meant to become a free person after the Civil War. She tracks a number of families. And save the date on April 26 for a presentation by Professor Anne Hyde about mixed descent peoples who made the American West. It's all in her new book, Born of Lakes and Plains. Don't miss hearing from this historian of the American West. Um, again, back to tonight, our mission at NEHGS is to educate, inspire, and connect people. We hope we've accomplished that tonight and that you'll come back for more programs. For now, Wayne and I, thank you. Thanks to everyone at Mass Audubon. Thanks to Porter Square Books. Uh, thanks to everyone behind the scenes in Boston. We were on the bleeding edge with us there with a hybrid production. Uh, we wish all of you out there in Zoom land a good evening, a great springtime full of birds, nature. Migrations are coming up. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. We hope to see you again. Have a very good night.